Hello and welcome to another lesson. Something really interesting this time around. Uh, today we are going to change our thinking or rather show you a slightly different aspect of lighting. So far we covered many different concepts, depth, tonal ranges, memory colors. We've talked about uh, the importance of composition and how to play with it rather than against it. Lots of different ways to perceive and see uh, if our lighting is on the right track. But in all the previous examples, we had something in pose from above. There was a fundamental handicap in all of this. We had the sun and we had a directional light which generate shadows that ultimately have a huge impact on the depth and composition. And there will be none of it in today's lesson. Today we are going to talk about overcast, a situation where we only have ambient light. We don't have strong shadows. All of this will make us have to change our thinking a little bit. We have to build depth differently. Thus, the whole geometrical core of our scene will become even more important, what we generally see in the viewport. Previously, we said that we need to listen to the composition and today we will get back to it. Another way to combine light and composition. We will make such a lighting scenario, but before that, we will answer some questions. Why would you want to approach overcast in the first place? And how we choose the right HDRI for it? So, here we go. We might ask ourselves, why do we even need an overcast? Has a client ever come to us and requested to visualize their building on a gray, gloomy, cloudy day? You know, artistically, we can do whatever we want, but it's nice to see what overcast can give us in a commercial work. Of course, this is not a common scenario for a number of reasons, but it does have advantages and we will try to talk about them with some examples. The first reason for choosing an overcast is that we can very quickly refer to some particular climate, often specific to a place or area. It might be rainforest or some fjords. You know, the sun is known to shine in those places. You know, yes, it does, it happened. But on the other hand, we definitely think of them more often in those more hazy situations. This is, in a way, characteristics of those places. If we have such a particular client or a project, we can steer them toward such a scenario. There is a bigger chance that they will find it more to their liking. The second and quite important reason is that we want to simplify our perception of the scene. Often we'll have situations where the architecture is pretty funky and very complicated, full of different architectural designs. That combined with daylight and directional light, can cause quite a mishmash. It's going to be hard to focus on anything because there's a lot going on. So, overcast can come to the rescue. We don't have the noise of the daylight or sunset light anymore. Everything just tones down and it's somehow more aesthetically pleasing. It's easier to read the geometry of the silhouette. The architecture comes forward and often the soft light makes everything look a little bit more elegant. For the viewer, the architecture will also be easier to understand. And a little advice from working with different clients, for some clients, especially architects, this scenario is very attractive. Sometimes showing the architecture even in a little abstract way, almost isolated white background seems to really work. Um, it allows you, you know, to make a sterile presentation. Overcast works really well if we want to simplify anything in our frame. There are many examples of that in the film. Here we have various different frames depicting the overcast and we see how filmmakers use this lighting scenario to, for example, play with silhouettes to simplify the composition of their image. Just a fun fact though. Back to our commercial work, and third reason, it's quite an interesting one as well. The third reason for using an overcast may be the desire to show the materials, especially the architectural ones, in a way that it's as close as possible to their catalog, 
characteristics. If our project has a lot of coloristic mishmash of various elements and structures on the facade, then the overcast will be a certain attempt to tame it all. And this is what we literally talked about in the last lesson about the color cast. In an intense or dynamic lighting situation, we can have a problem with color. If we have a green facade in combination with the sunset, everything is going to be blown apart for us. The facade in the shade will be blue, while the one in the sun becomes yellow. By contrast, in the overcast, we can maintain that sterile catalog look. And the same applies to all reflective surfaces, which during the day can generate some very strong gradients, very strong light, and some different highlights in unfortunate areas. When we look at the facades, though these expanses of glass, of course, we see some gradients, but these gradients in the case of the overcast are quite tamed. There will be some nuance on the glass, but it won't be such a banal gradient and it won't be such a uniform color, and a properly done overcast really gets the job done. Circling back now, there are a lot of pros, but there are also a few cons uh, that more or less rule out the choice of overcast, and here, very briefly, a serious counter-indication is the very subject of our work. You know, if we are developing the marketing of a tropical resort, we will in no way sell the subject matter. If we are telling a story about some barbecue in the garden, we wouldn't want to experience another uh, like thick layer of cloud either. Some narratives are governed by their own laws and we cannot jump over them. Another thing is, before we start proposing this scenario to a client, it is worth considering whether our scene is too simple, for example. If it doesn't have interesting silhouettes or strong geometric contrast, it may turn out that the overcast is simply boring, especially as it tends to flatten our scenes. In such situations, perhaps, daylight will bring our image to life a little more effectively. Seemingly, any scenario can be done in an overcast, even if the scene is simple, but if you don't have experience with it, it can be a very difficult task and there is no need to go into it unnecessary trouble. Okay, now, before we get into making this scenario, we will generally be using HDRI again. So, before we jump into the action, here's a handful of the information to choose an overcast HDRI. Remember, everything we talked about in the previous lessons applies here as well. The resolution, depth, and visual content is something you can investigate. And just as a reminder, all of this is covered in lesson number 5 regarding HDRIs, but with Overcast, we can still pay attention to a few additional things. We have a compilation of several HDRIs from 3D Collective and PG Skies, and let's move on to the analysis. The first thing we look at will be whether there is any visible sun at all in the HDRI. And of course, we are not talking about sunshine like in the daytime, but is there any penetration of sunlight through the clouds at all? If you look at those HDRIs, you can see that there is not really any penetration. They are fairly evenly gray across the whole image. Here, on the other hand, we can already see that the sun is beginning to break through somewhere. The light will be more directional. It will also affect whether there are more reflections somewhere. Some overcast HDRIs can be quite directional. Sometimes the boundary between daylight and overcast is quite conventional with those HDRIs. Whereas here, we see that certainly these directionalities will not be there. In fact, it's hard to say whether one situation is better than the other. We have to decide what we need for the scene, what we are looking for, and which direction to go in. Secondly, we should pay attention to the cloud dynamism in our HDRI. Are they more dynamic, such as here, or less dynamic and pretty uniform as here? And here, the rule of thumb is that 
I wouldn't be afraid to choose skies that have two dynamic clouds. Even if this contrast seem very intense, in the rendering they will all flatten out. We will have an additional photometric fog and it will overlap with those HDRIs. So I wouldn't be afraid of that. In fact, it's common for us to use color correction maps and increase the contrast to an HDRI. And I don't think it's even happened that we had to somehow lower them. Generally, in overcast, people often end up with a very uniformly light grey color, very abstract, and that's kind of an option too. Then we get that kind of sterile, abstract look. Personally, we are not exactly fans of that, and we are looking for at least some light detail, even if it plays out on a relatively small tonal dynamic range. Our Third criteria is whether the HDRI has any color cast issues. Sometimes you can notice that overcast HDRIs aren't completely grey. Often we have some visible portions of the sky and then we gain those color casts of warm and cold and you know it's very much acceptable. If the HDRI is also for example warm from the sun or uniformly cool and this should not pose any problems. Problems may arise if they manifest themselves somewhere with too much color cast on the green magenta axis, if they are twisted somewhere. If we miss that situation and use it uh, in a scene, it may turn out that such an HDRI can spoil all the colors in our image for us. We covered this issue in lesson number 8 while lowering the gamma. The same is true here with those overcast HDRIs. You have to watch out for magenta, violet and greenish color casts. It can be corrected later in the correction, but it's always a potential problem. Even if it's like 5-10% tint and you don't identify it straight away, those problems start to stack up in combination with some lots, with a change of gamma and it can lead to an unpleasant look. Though. If you go for 3D Collective or PG Skies, you shouldn't stumble upon any of those issues. So you're covered here. Okay, that will be pretty much it. Bart, please take it away. Okay, so that would be enough theory. Quick and easy. So now let's move on to the action. Generally, we want to act as we did before in terms of the technicalities and the process of building the scene. It's exactly like the previous scenarios. We'll start by building the depth, we'll divide our image into layers, establish some sun directionality as much as we can with an overcast of course, and introduce a subtle relation of light and shadow. We'll try to darken the foreground so there is a correct readable depth. Then we will do something new unique to this scenario. We're going to modify the materials. We are going to add some moisture to them so that they get a little bit of that extra micro contrast, just like on the, you know, dewy leaves. We'll also do some relighting. We will, you know, we will introduce artificial lights into the scene which have no physical justification but will influence our perception of it. We'll also add some interior lights to build additional contrast and more exciting color palette. At the very end, we'll jump into Photoshop and do a final touch. So there we go. And okay, without further ado, we've done this a few times so far. We fire up the scene, open Slate Material Editor and pull out the Corona bitmap to upload our HDRI. This time we are going to take the PG Skies 1927 HDRI you can also use 3D Collective 1210 attached to this training. And right away Corona Color Correct to have extra control over that and we plug that into our lighting source. We look to see if we have the low poly layer switched on and we can also immediately turn on the interactive.
Finally, we have our scene visible. It is a bit too bright, especially in the foreground. But of course this problem is known to us. I think the overall exposure can be at those levels, more or less, and we want to change the tone mapping for this scenario to filmic. In such a way that we will both set highlight compression as well as rich shadows. And maybe lower that brightness a bit. Let's say to minus one, at least for the moment. And at this stage we see that the whole image is too bright and bland, and it doesn't look too good. Well, this is a common situation that happens in overcast scenarios. 3D artists often lay down their gauntlets at this point and go for overlighting conditions. But fear not, we'll go over step by step what needs to be done. And the first thing we will do is, of course, once we have adjusted this exposure, to see where our tonal range lies. We can also help ourselves here by looking at the whole thing in black and white. So we will add our black and white LUT here, so we will be able to better determine where our ranges land. We can of course also use pure ref to insert some references there and use them. However, this time we will just eyeball it. We would like to look more or less for a separation between these two walls. And of course it won't be easy because we don't have sun and shadow now as we did before, but operate on such a non-directional light which illuminates the scene from almost all sides. So let's maybe see what we can get by rotating this HDRI. And we can see that the relationships of these walls change a little bit. This separation becomes more vivid. And also when we look in full color, this division of the walls is quite noticeable. So I will stay with this HDRI rotation value. And unfortunately the sky hasn't taken on the dynamics we would like. Even if we lower it a little bit more, well, here we are slowly starting to go too deep, and the sky is very bright all the time. That's why we have to solve it a bit differently. And it would be nice if the sky was crisper looking, so that's what we'll try to focus on. In order to compare this progression of ours, we can save this view in the history here. And now move on. What we would like to do is what we already know from the earlier scenarios. We want to introduce some overrides. And first of all, we want to introduce a direct override here so we can adjust the visible portion of the sky. So I'm going to copy Corona Color Correction node. And I'm going to drag that map here as an instance. And we will definitely want to make it darker here. We can also resort to lowering gamma, and that will give the HDRI a little bit of extra contrast, and those tonal differences will come to the foreground more. And as we were saying earlier, if there were any color casts in this HDRI, here they could start to come out when we twist this gamma. And changing the gamma immediately shows what kind of blood the HDRI is made of, especially if we go down below to 0 0.8 or 0 0.7. This HDRI is thankfully very naturalistic in appearance. And as far as I'm concerned, it's pretty much okay here. If we look at the clouds, they are generally where we would like them to be, and the shadows too. On the other hand, if we look at the image as a whole, it's definitely dark in the mid-tones. I can even go down to minus two with this and now it's even more apparent. You know, as we mentioned before, generally such a scattered greenery in the interactive view 
comes out a bit darker and more muddy than in the final rendering. So we can sort of accept it and add that as an over iteration in our history. We can look at the whole thing in black and white and we can at least see that the sky is landing now somewhere we would like it to. Whereas the rest is obviously still far from its optimum. So as we can see that this forest and certain elements of the building are the darkest elements in the image, which as we already know should give us some food for thought. The middle ground does not completely cut off from the background here. Let's look at the relationship of these trees. They are very much the same with each other. And it doesn't help either with all the stones, which are basically the brightest part of this picture. No, especially those are brighter than the building itself, which is what we want to focus on. What's more, the colors can seem strange. They can seem twisted, a little too saturated and a little neon-like. Somehow they generally started appearing all over the place. However, as I mentioned earlier, it is not necessarily a color problem at this stage, but rather a brightness issue. First, we should solve the tonal problems, the brightness problems, and only then see where these colors land and possibly modify them. So the next step will simply be to gradually build depth in our scene. We want all the sets to play together, and this is analogous to what we did during the day and the sunset. We want to build an aerial perspective to separate that background in our image. We would like to enclose these mountains with a box to introduce this kind of selective volumetrics here. And we are going to place this box locally because we don't want our building to appear in any way hazy. We don't want to lose the contrast on our building. It's supposed to be a fairly commercial image, so we do not simply want to introduce this kind of fog that dominates everywhere here. Okay, so we built it up with a giant box. And you can still add a height to it. And more or less the whole background is covered. It starts somewhere here, behind the building, behind this area and it practically covers the whole mountain. So now we have to add volume material and we'll see what it looks like. We focus on these hills and we need to select the values for this volume material. We just type it in whatever might feel okay for us and evaluate the effect. Here, of course, we want to land this somewhere in mid-gray. And we are looking at that with this value set, of course, so you can't see anything at the moment. All we have is a drab, dark fog. So we go in for something thinner. And this is where it starts to get a bit more interesting. Maybe we will add 0 0.2 in this directionality here. And you'll have to trust us, we'll talk about directionality in lessons about the volumetrics. But I think we can get some new ones here with this. So for now, without too much comment. In general, we are not aiming for such an overly hazy atmosphere. We want it to be a crispy overcast with relatively high clouds. So maybe I will lighten it up a bit and now I can judge it better. Now the fog on the mountains is not very strong, but something is starting to happen here. And perhaps a little more will happen if we apply some bluish color to this fog here.
With the daylight scenario, we are introducing this tint to achieve some naturalism of the aerial perspective at all. With the overcast, the same tint is also present, but only if we are dealing with the higher altitude clouds. If this fog was grey, it would give us the information that the clouds are indeed very low, that the mountains are in fact covered with them to some extent. It's a bit of a nuance, but with overcast nuances often determine whether the effect is commercial or more artistic. And definitely this blue tint creates a certain kind of naturalism and a feeling that we don't have such a low slang fog. Also, this blue tint makes the whole picture so much more vibrant, so it's also a sort of a conscious artistic choice. I'll keep these values for now and again we can add this image to history to compare this progression later. We can look at it in black and white again, so we can see of course that we've been able to build this depth in the background. So the only thing left to us now is to address the foreground. If we go back to the saturation, then of course the color cast is bluish on these mountains far away. And thanks to it we also start to draw some color contrast that further break up these layers for us and improve the readability of the image. We'll talk about this in a bit more detail in the lesson on contrast and building color palettes. In the meantime, let's go back to building our depth and deal with the foreground straight away. This is what we did in the previous scenes. And we will need the same approach even more here. You can play with this aspect even more, because this dark foreground will be crucial for building depth, the spatial feeling of the scene, and generally the attractiveness of the whole scene. I'm going to start by building a new box, which will be one that is quite deep and will cover entire foreground. That is, the camera will be sort of in the middle of this box. Here we can go straight to this material color so that we can see something other than these big random colored lamps. I'm going to lower this box a little bit because it automatically inserts itself a little bit too high here. We are also going to rotate it a little bit here and it's key now to convert it into editable poly. And we remove this front face and we start to see our scene. So far it's quite messy like this. We need to give it some basic material there. And this time we can go for a slightly darker diffuse. And now it's a matter of matching and adjusting this box to our scene. We can see how this depth of the box affects our perception of the foreground. If we had the wall itself, as before, then basically, and with the overcast especially, the darkening of the foreground would be negligible. That light is coming from all sides and it's hard for us to create that impression of such profoundness in the foreground. So we often have to work as if and just create this box deeper which we like to call a sort of a tunnel vision. As we can see right away, uh, we are gaining a great deal of darkening here, in the foreground. We are even able to bring it absurdly deep. We would have to pitch it a bit so it doesn't come into our camera view, but then it gives the impression that we are just sitting somewhere in a very dark corner. Yeah, we can see the foreground is almost black and we don't necessarily want to go all the way to something like that. It's overdone. So I will go back a bit to what we had here. Mm, 
maybe I will lengthen it a little bit sideways to cut some of the light from here. But that's more or less what we are looking for. We've darkened that foreground, but without any kind of exaggeration. Whenever we place such elements, we always try to control whether they are reflected somewhere in the view in some kind of artificial, unpleasant way. And this can be a bigger or smaller problem. For example, if we are looking straight at a glass wall, we may not be able to solve this issue with such a box. Then we'd have to look for some natural solutions like trees and so on, which will cover this space instead. In our case, however, the box is reflected here in the corner of this curved glazing. You know, we could for example render this patch a second time without the box and patch it into this area, but overall I think it's acceptable as it is. If I hadn't told you, you probably wouldn't have even noticed it, so we don't worry about it too much. For the time being, it's not worth the struggle. Nonetheless, it's a pretty essential part of a scene building, especially in overcast, to cut that foreground from that scattered light. And a reminder that foreground role is incredibly important. So if any time something appears to be wrong with the lighting in your project, it could be a problem with composition and the way the foreground is built. Nevertheless, we'll check it out and perform another analysis. Certainly, that foreground has gone down a bit. It may not be quite so low, still some elements here, the stones, are lighter than the building itself, but it is certainly much better now. You can even say that the difference is dramatic in some places. In fact, for the first time the scene is starting to look attractive in some way, because we can see that the depth is starting to be correct. And so certainly this forest somewhere in the background is not darker than the foreground, so this hierarchy is correct. The foreground is also not that absorbing anymore. Maybe apart from some elements somewhere on the stones, but we'll come back to them. Little by little, the colors, which may have previously seemed oddly neon in the foreground, suddenly start to feel more natural. There's less of that diffuse to translucency ratio, less direct light and everything looks more like it should. So once again, you can see on a living organism that you need to focus on brightness before we affect our colors. And now this. The whole thing in general can appear a little dark. And this is due to the fact that mid-ranges are very close to the blacks. We can see how our histogram looks. Yeah, the mid-ranges and shadows are very close together. And we could contort this curve. But for now we don't want to by virtue of the fact that we will be adding, not subtracting light here. We are going to change the materials, add some moisture on them, which will instantly give us some more brilliance. We'll also learn the basics of relighting, which means we'll add some extra lights to the scene. And all of this will give the image more punch. And finally, this correction with the curves will probably be done to bring out the contrast even more. On the other hand, once again now, the image may seem a bit too dark, but we reckon we still have some of that light to add, so we don't necessarily need to readjust it now. Okay, so we have this spatial feeling set up, and the next thing we are going to want to do is just to modify the materials. And of course, if we were to add this kind of moisture, that kind of extra gloss to all our materials in a daylight scenario, it would probably be too much, because suddenly we'd have glints of light everywhere. Overcast, on the other hand, tends to flatten the surfaces. Many materials like the simpler floors, walls and so on, they definitely come out flatter in this scenario. And that's why I think it's a good tip to look for this moisture here. You know, it is able to introduce some extra nuance to the materials, to introduce some micro-contrast. It is going to add some extra detail, add sharpness as well as crispiness and basically we can jump straight into this modification of the materials. 
and in fact most of the materials in the scene could be modified. Again, this can seem like a huge challenge, but don't worry. In the sunset lesson, we found that changing the translucency from materials is not that problematic, because there is a limited number of them. Here we will want to change, in addition to the greenery material, for example the materials of the stones, the facade, so there will be definitely more. Especially as these stones often have such quite unique textures. That's why we will start this process together and then we will fast forward it. But ok, let's start somewhere. Let's maybe start with the facade. And you know, we don't have to change absolutely all the materials in the scene, of course. It is possible to omit some, especially those that are assigned to tiny fragmented objects like some moss or junipers. They can generally produce some unpleasant messy specular reflections, but I will try to adjust them anyways. But on the other hand, it is such a case that it can possibly be avoided. Similarly, if we have some gravel, some sand, this gloss can often be too much, so it is worth bearing this in mind. However, as I said, we start with our facade, and this is where we should make it fairly easy to notice what is going on. The simplest thing to do for each gloss here is to add a corona color correction and some value here preferably a constant for all materials. And I'm going to add myself uh, 0.2. We can see that this object already has quite a bit of gloss on it, so actually on this one maybe a little less. Again, 0.2 here. So let's see what that looks like. And it's already starting to draw much greater separation of these certain wall elements. I think we could even maybe add a 0 0.3 here to make it look better. Maybe apart from this one heavily bright layer, I mean this one component material. And we can see that uh, the gloss is lifted everywhere, but wherever the bump or displacement is greater, these areas naturally appear darker. So, as a result, this smooth part shines more and this facade immediately becomes more alive. So, that's kind of one object that we've modified and we can move on to the stones. Maybe let's start with the ones on the front. And we should be able to notice the difference quite quickly. We can see that this material is quite complex, but we are sort of adding corona color correction to the last connection in this gloss channel. And as we started with 0.3 previously, we are also continuing with 0.3 here. We can see that there is starting to be a bit of glossy shimmer to this stone here. It's not some very visible change, but I think just enough to suggest uh, to us some moisture. We can go higher, but I would rather not overdo it. I think it's better to give it too little than too much. Then, when everything is super shiny, we get a rather artificial effect which we don't want. So, one step at a time. First, second, and third stone. I will do the stones later in a time lapse. And as for now, maybe I will do some more greenery. We remember that a lot of this greenery uh, is somewhere here within Corona scatter objects, so I will deal with these tweaks, for example. The second tweak here. And here we have a corona correction, uh, so we can immediately make this modification with it as we wish. 
it was minus 0.1, so 0.2 will come out of the addition. There should be another twig material somewhere. Okay, we are adding 0.3 to each of them. And twigs should start appearing slightly different, but we are unlikely to see that on the interactive, unfortunately. These are such small elements that somewhere it is going to get lost in this noise, in this small resolution. On the other hand, here we can take our word for it, that the impression of dampness will certainly be more intense. So now we'll do the fast forward part and we'll turn maybe this interactive off so that we don't necessarily have to update this scene every time we change material. And on fast forward we'll change these materials here. Maybe I will make this fog display as a box so that we don't get disturbed and we'll go one object at a time. So yes, I think everything has been pretty much sprinkled with some water. Let's see. Let's see what impact the change of materials has in this scenario. We haven't moved anything in terms of the light. Above all, what is striking is the readability of the facade itself. But you know, also here, the tree bark, these stones, they now have such a completely different tone. As far as the greenery is concerned, it's hard to say, but that's mainly because in the interactive we are operating on these low poly layers, as well as the interactive itself doesn't help to reach such small specular details we can see that there's something going on here, but it's hard to tell a bit. We can again add it to the history here. Okay, so it looks reasonably cool. I think it's definitely nicer than how we had it without the moisture. We can even compare what we had here, what it looked like before and what it looks like after. It kind of gives us more information about what's going on here. Well, and like I said, you can see that distinct elevations and the stones, but practically the whole expression of this scene has changed somewhere. If we compare it all with our first render, I would say they are different as day and night. Okay, so now it's time to move on to the next step, to something new. We are going to get into relighting, which is generally such a fancy name for inserting fake light sources. It's a bit like on a film set, especially in a commercial somewhere. When a film crew goes to a location and wants to shoot shots, then often the conditions found are far from ideal. It's either too bright or too dark, and it all has to be shaped somehow. We have to cut off some of the incident light, cover the windows or literally obscure it as we did with our box behind the camera. On the other hand, additional lights are also inserted at the various points in the frame, simply to make it look better, more attractive. And all this is conducted by an operator or a gaffer on a set. And in front of the computer, it will be you, of course. And we'll definitely be talking more about relighting in the lesson about night lighting soon, but today try to copy what we'll be doing. Just be inspired by the effect and you'll get a deeper understanding a little later. At this stage, talking about the very simple basics of relighting, we are going to try to lighten up that area between the building and the camera a little bit. Here, somewhere in this very intersection of foreground and midground. 
And the easiest way to do that is by inserting a corona sphere into the scene. Corona light, we choose a sphere here and let's insert it somewhere here into our scene. When inserting light like this, it's definitely worth looking out for a few things. These ones are technical rather than artistic, but it's good to start with them. Four quick aspects to tick off one by one. So we want the lights not to be directly visible in the camera. And this can be achieved very simply by deselecting the directly visible option. Also, we want the lights not to be clearly visible in the reflections. We don't want any spheres appearing somewhere in the glass or water surface, and we are immediately able to see something like that in the interactive if it happens. On the other hand though, we want these reflections in the form of smaller specular highlights to appear somewhere on plants and boulders, so making this invisible in reflections is not necessarily what we are looking for. Okay, the first thing we could do is weaken this light a little bit, the second is to move it a little bit in that direction. It shows up somewhere in this curved corner of glass here, but it's quite subtle and probably won't bother us. You know, we don't have this obvious sphere that appears somewhere in this flat glass. If we were to put this light somewhere here, for example, we'd have something like that, an obvious source of light revealed. But I will try to push it into this place somewhere here. And we can also rise this sphere a little bit more. And this way, we have managed to hide this light from the plain sight. Now it is a question of possibly weakening it further. We can see that this light shines on this facade very much and we don't necessarily want it because it's nice if there's a difference in brightness between those two walls. So we'll make it a little weaker. We'll let just a little bit of this brightness to influence it but don't let it change the relationships we have set up before. I will also copy drag this sphere somewhere here. Maybe even a little closer. You know, just to let a little of the light into this foreground. We can still play with the color a bit, but in general we want this light to be more or less the same color temperature as this atmospheric ambience, which is slightly cold. I'm going to set 7500 Kelvin, a slightly cool light. In the interactive I think this relighting won't be very noticeable at the moment, but later on when we compare each scene we saved in history, I think the difference for everyone will be clear. The general idea is that we don't want to disturb the lighting of the scene, but only to support it a little. We want to lighten some of the areas which were too low, to make them a little brighter and above all, to gain some nuance somewhere in the reflections in those wet specular highlights somewhere on the metal, somewhere on the leaves, and also on the facade. And all this will improve our perception. We can also save it in our history. Compare it with the last version. We can see that there is a little bit going on here. 
it's very, very subtle. Whereas, as I said, I think it will be more pronounced in the production rendering. Nevertheless, we definitely prefer to keep it subtle rather than overdo it. Now, if we look at the whole thing in black and white, we can see that as far as the tonal ranges are concerned, everything seems to be more or less in place. We can also look back at the histogram. The mid-ranges are still very close to the shadows, but this distribution is a bit wider already. We are left with our last big move, which is that we want to add the interior lights here. In fact, at this point we could already render this and go into Photoshop. We've learned how to set the light and get the depth correct in the overcast scenario. We added a new concept of relighting to improve the depth and details. We added light for the first time in the sense of literally adding it instead of subtracting it by some shadow. However, as the icing on the cake, we will do one last thing and add those interior lights. We haven't used such lights yet, but these lights were in the scene all the time. Now we turn them on as a separate layer and we see some interior spotlights appearing here. Let's see how that looks in the rendering. We'll talk a lot more about these interior lights in the nighttime scenario. Now we are just going to introduce them without too much commentary. Generally, this is something we'll play out in the next lessons. There we will tell ourselves why these types of lamps are used and why are they in such a place and not another. Well, and now is a question of the adjustments the intensity of these lamps. They are mostly here as instants, so they should change pretty much all at once. At least those similar ones because, for example, the lamps on the ground floor and the lamps on the second floor are placed separately. If we can sort of see that with this, we have added an extra quality to the building. This is, uh, it definitely stands out more. If you look at it in black and white, you might not see it, but we've added a very distinct color contrast, which builds up a solid color palette in addition to these bluish mountains that we already had in the scene. So, at this point, we can still add that to the render history as our final iteration and compare them. And we can see that, certainly, the image immediately becomes more pleasing to look at. So I think it's a good time to finish working on this, turn on all the high-poly layers and move on to the final rendering. Maybe I will fade those lights out a bit more yet and let's go. We have our final rendering and we are going to do a really quick post-production, mainly focusing on mid-range redistribution to make this image a little bit more accessible, more commercial. 
So I'm going into channels here with the left control pressed in and I'm going to click on the red channel to have a selection. I'm throwing in the curves and lowering these ranges so that these tones don't scream as much. I'm protecting the shadows a little bit here. And it's better already. And there is one thing here that was bothering me and I wanted to do it manually. This blip of light that is reflected here. I think it's a little bit annoying, so we'll just take a soft brush with the darken option and clone stamp to clean up this area. And now we can move on to the main part, which is the mid-range redistribution, which in itself is quite trivial because we set ourselves a curve and simply leave these mid-ranges. You know, uh, they can be more to the left, more to the right, depending on the image, but in general, we can see that it immediately changes the perception of the whole from being a bit dark and heavy being much more accessible. The colors, which were smothered here, also look different. Here they have more of that saturation, they look fresher, more healthy. In addition, we can also make a vignette here. This time I'm going to do it by choosing a black color and I'm going to mix it with a soft light blending mode with some slightly lower opacity. So we've got a vignette. Maybe I will add one more curve and we'll try to lift this element a little bit here on the elevation without any specific masks. I just use a big soft brush to paint it here. And there is no need to be very precise with this kind of subtle modification. Maybe coming back to this layer, where we had the main mid-range redistribution, I can mask these sky elements a little bit so that they don't go upwards that much in this area. Okay, and this can be considered finished. And now we can see render scenes one by one. So we have our first scene where we insert the HDRI and we don't have depth and we don't have these tonal ranges set up. And here we are slowly starting to build them up by darkening the sky, by adding depth and starting to build up the color palette. Even in the overcast, which we associate with gray, this palette exists and can significantly affect the perception. We add this tunnel vision, we lower the foreground ranges and it gets quite dark, but on the other hand, the depth starts to play for the first time and it's a good base to build on. So we increase the moisture of the materials, above all the facade, the stones and the greenery a little bit more. We add relighting, very subtle in this scenario. It lifts some of the tones in the center of the composition, but it's more of a nuance here. We don't want to overdo it. We turn on and adjust the interior lights, creating a color counterpoint that is ultimately largely responsible for the commercial appeal. And the post-production, where mainly by controlling the mid-range redistribution, we increase the pop of this image a little, to make it even more commercially viable. Therefore, this scenario is completed. In the next one, we'll talk about the overcast with a little twist. We'll let some sun rays in, while leaving those heavy clouds on. I will see you there.